Stacking Surfer. So like, I think I'm your best friend. Balances in your bank. What's up, everybody? Stacking Surfer here. I'm excited to have another video here with Andy Sheckman from Miles Franklin. Um, and guys, I'm excited. We haven't had him on for a little bit, um, but things have changed. We have new information that's come out in the last uh, month or so. And um, as always, there's there's something that's changing, something that's happening out there for us. So I've got Andy here today, and um, hopefully he'll have some great information for us. I know he will. And we're going to be able to help you guys in your journey of understanding precious metals, as well as markets and where things may go, and also what the reality of money is. So Andy, welcome to uh, welcome to the video. How are you? Good to be back. I'm, I'm well, thank you. I hope you are and everyone else out there is doing well. Crazy times, that's for sure. It is. So here in California, the rain has stopped. The flowers are coming out. Um, we've never seen it so green. So right now we're seeing a, a wonderful, you know, spring as we're just getting started into that. Yeah, well, that's good. It was a little scary watching the, the deluge of rain that was... Uh, it was bad. Breaking apart all the hillsides in California. It's, uh, it seems that there's just been lots of, um, lots of, of, of weather related issues over the last couple of years. You know, it's, uh, mother nature's not very happy maybe. And just showing that, showing it through, uh, you know, tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and earthquakes. And uh, let's hope things settle down here for a little bit. Glad things are better in California. Yeah, I, me too. We, um, I live near the beach. We had a lot of landslides. Uh, we lost a couple of our trails. Um, luckily, they were able to stop the homes from sliding. Mm. Uh, but we're definitely having to repair a bunch of stuff. So it's it's good to have that over um, and be able to to repair from it. Right. So on. so Andy, um, I'm trying to think where we left things off. I know we had some good conversations around the bricks. Uh, we were talking about banks as well. And even about the markets, and most recently, I've seen in the markets that um, equities have have started to hit up against the ceiling and going past some of their all time highs. Um, Bitcoin has gone up; it's come back down a little bit. It's retraced, uh, but it went over over the all time high. Um, and even gold, we saw it break, and it's kind of retraced a little bit. Um, is there anything we should be thinking about in the market out there that you're aware of that may be causing that, or um, that we could get prepared for? Well, you know, I mean, we have uh, an equity market when you talk about all time highs. Look, you have some of the worst breadth, B-R-E-D-T-H, breadth uh, that the market's ever seen. And and in, when you go back and look at market uh, blow offs or markets that that continue to rise with with only a handful of stocks leading the way it always ends poorly and it was the the big seven and now it's the big four mm -hmm. um if you look at the s p 500 the majority of the stocks in the s p 500 are treading water at best or underwater when you look at the russell 2000 which is a broader measure of, of maybe the smaller cap stocks throughout the economy it's a it's a better indication of the economy i mean most of those are are doing poorly Yep. You have a handful of stocks that are defying gravity uh, and with it bringing the market along for the ride. And so that's very dangerous as far as I'm concerned. It, it's very, very dangerous. And, you know, look, we've had several years all let, let's just take the last year out of the equation. But, you know, 10, 15 years of suppressed interest rates and, and money creation that has created massive distortions and misallocations of capital and resources, distortions in prices and in asset values. Um, I, I think that in, in general, uh, the stock market to me is a very dangerous place to be right now. Now people would say it's an election year and, and they're, they're talking about lowering interest rates to support the, you know, the rally in the market in election year. I, I can't see how they can lower rates. I really, I really can't. And, you know, it's a situation right now where you know, our our debt is ever increasing by a trillion dollars every hundred days. Now, you know, if you go back and look at the end of, of 2023, uh, we had, or excuse me, end of 2022, we had a debt of uh, $31 trillion, uh, $32 trillion. And then it ends... A year later, January 1, 2024, it's up $2.6 trillion to over $34 trillion. 
And that took over 230 years to do it the first time we did it in a year. And now they're adding a trillion dollars every 100 days. We are a government or a country that is addicted to spending. And when you talk about what's happening in the treasury market, you know, you could argue that the weaponizing of the dollar, uh, the inflationary uh, undertones of the dollar, the country that's addicted to spending, all of these things put together and making our treasuries much less attractive. And that's why you're seeing these tails on some of the, the longer duration treasuries, a tail being that the price that is initially issued, there aren't enough buyers to buy it. So they have to continue to raise the, the offer higher and higher and higher to attract the buyers. It'll always be buyers, just depends upon what the the, the offering is how much interest that they're going to pay you. But the bottom line is, is that lowering interest rates signals to the world that we've given up on, on ever trying to normalize the balance sheet. We've given up on austerity and we've chosen inflation as our path. Now, when you, when you are a country that is choosing inflation on one end and at the same time are weaponizing the dollar and treasury market against countries around the world who don't align ideologically, it's a very ominous sign. And so I would simply say to, to people right now that I don't expect interest rates to go lower. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that, <coughs> excuse me, that they're going to do it in June or July. And I think that's foolhardy at best. Uh, and, and that's what would spur even further growth in an already over leveraged stock market. So for me, profit is not a four letter word. And I think that <laughs> making a good run in the in the market the way people have over the last uh, few years, you know, sitting on the sidelines, taking your profit and letting things uh, unwind, letting things play out as we head into what ought to be a very volatile uh, year into the election, into the 200 meetings that lead up to the big uh, meeting for the BRICS in October. Yeah, I'm not as bullish as, as the analysts on CNBC are. In fact, right now, I think... Uh, People should be cautious at very best. So, Andy, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I would agree with you. Um, I put a video out recently that talked about um, two different price predictions for me. Um, one was a lower price for some gold and silver. One's a higher price for gold and silver. Um, the condition I looked at for the lower price was basically based on if the Fed actually were to, to raise interest rates. Um, I don't know if I see that happening right now. To me, it looks like they're going to hold them steady. But to your point, I really don't think they can lower them. Well, look, I mean, look at it this way. Even in the face of, of and, and I say this biting my tongue, because we know that the CPI is CP lie. We know that the, the numbers and the massaging of the CPI index is, is set to accommodate an inflationary agenda by the U.S. government. And they exclude things like food and energy and housing. And if we look at John Williams of Shadow Stats, who only shows the CPI, the way it was calculated prior to them taking these adjustments and putting them into the metric back in 1980 and then 1990 when they made it the first adjustment, uh, inflation would be closer to 11% than it is at the 5% or 4% or 3%, whatever the number is. Let's say it's, you know, it's now 5% annualized based by the last CPI reading. So, but for the past six, eight months or longer, you could argue we've been getting, or even the last year almost, positive real return when you when you factor in the CP lie against the numbers on the 10-year or the even the six-month, not the 10-year, the six-month treasury, the short-term treasuries where you can get five and a half percent in a very short-term duration treasury, which outpaces inflation if you believe the inflation numbers, right? So in the face of positive real return, which would be the antithesis of gold that doesn't, or the argument people would use against gold, it doesn't pay a coupon. There is no interest on gold. Uh, and for the last decade plus, I would say, well, it sure beats the pants off of negative real return or negative and negative return in terms of higher inflation than you have on interest rates um, in a very low interest rate environment. But in the face of this uh, a positive real return, gold has done very well. It's held up in the face of, of a return on treasuries that is um, greater than the inflation rate. So, you know, I don't think they can raise rates. And yeah, they can massage the, the short end if they want for a little bit. But I think they've kind of reached a point where 
they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. If yep. if you know they continue to to ignite inflation through lowering of rates and and accommodating the you know the ease in which people are able to borrow money, then you just jack up inflation, which leads to higher interest rates anyway. And you lose confidence. You know the world will will say you know they'll never fix it, and and we already are losing confidence globally on many levels, as I've touched on. So to retreat from uh, from trying to balance or to normalize the balance sheet, to retreat from um, fighting inflation, only signals you know what much of the world already knows, and and they will lose greater and greater confidence. Look, when the bottom line is simply this: is that I I think that you can't go any lower in rates, or you will begin to precipitously lose demand for the treasury, and 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 I think that again leads to higher rates just to attract people to buy the debt. So they're damned if they do, they're damned if they don't. I truly believe that rates cannot afford to go materially lower than they are right now. And if they did do a token drop, it would be something like a quarter or a half a point, which would mean nothing. And at some point, the market has to, uh, I think, exert itself with greater force than the Fed has the will or or the ability to do because at some point the market is just going to say look we don't want your treasury debt in uh issued by a country that is inflating away their currency which is eroding the value of the treasury which ultimately leads to high higher interest rates and by the way the weaponizing of the dollar where we have our brain dead treasury secretary sitting in brazil which is a member of BRICS two weeks ago saying we need to confiscate the russian forex reserves of 380 billion in forex reserves not just sanction them the way we did Iran, but to confiscate them and use them to rebuild the Ukraine. Uh, you've crossed a line, a, a Rubicon that you can never come back from. The whole Southern Hemisphere will never trust us ever again. And so ultimately, I would say that, you know, pigs get fed and hogs get slaughtered. And if you're using uh, interest rates and interest rate guidance, if you will, as to decide your the direction of your investments, I would say, take your profit, sit on the sidelines. Even if you don't buy gold and silver, you know, you can buy, earn 5% plus in a six month treasury with little to no risk. Any duration in the US treasury market, well, then you start to get into all sorts of risk. And I would simply say, that's what the world is seeing. I would simply say that there are better places to be right now where return on your money is great, but return of it is even better. Uh, I am not a, a, a uh, equity market bull right now, and I'm not a duration bull in treasuries either. But I think the sweet spot for people who are confused right now would be just sit, park it, and you go right to treasurydirect.gov, which is sidestepping all of the, the commercial bank and, um, risk, uh, the systemic risk of the banking system. Go to treasurydirect.gov and buy some six-month treasuries and, and wait and figure it out. That is if you don't want to buy precious metals, which... Look, the central banks of the world have bought more over the last few years than at any time in human history, really, or any time in banking history. So, um, yeah, it, it's an interesting, crazy time where, or an unconventional time where unconventional times call for unconventional thought. And I think it's time to start thinking that way. I agree. So thank you for sharing that. I think that's that's great advice. Um, I also I, I feel very much the same way from what I'm seeing and what I'm reading and the research I'm doing. Um what you know so looking at that another option is for people to consider gold and silver so a lot of people that watch this channel already have gold and silver um some of them are reevaluating the kind of metals that they're buying so for example maybe they've been buying large bars and they're starting to think about buying um you know coins or rounds um others have been buying very collectible stuff that has a high premium and they're starting to think maybe i should go for weight um and then you still have others that have been really heavy gold or really heavy silver and they're looking at the opposite metals to potentially get into. Um, do you have any thoughts on where you think gold and silver prices may be going? Do you see one as a better upside and maybe one is more stable? What, what are your thoughts on the gold and silver market right now until the end of the year? Yeah, I, well, I think the, the markets are signaling much higher prices. I mean, we can start with gold and we can say that gold has, of course, blown through resistance. There is no more resistance above it. Uh, support now, in essence, would be 2100. And and when you're at a in a market where resistance is gone, in a market where the world is accumulating at levels that, you know, we've never seen before, where the central banks are buying it hand over fist, 
um, really the sky is the limit for gold. Who knows how high it goes because you don't have anything above it to act as as resistance. And, you know, at the same time, we're seeing tremendous amount of gold bled off of the exchanges, off the COMEX, uh, off of the um, uh, the LBMA. Uh, and this signals very sophisticated buyers that are just gobbling everything up as fast as they can, uh, taking it using the subsidized price of the Western market. Uh, the price setting mechanism of the Western market to to bleed the exchanges dry. And, and that's also, I mean, it's it's deeper than that. I mean, we can talk about the fact that what's going on right now in, in Shanghai, as an example, where gold is priced $70, $80 higher than it is here in the West, that's arbitrage. They're turning up slowly, turning up the heat to entice the traders who have access to the COMEX, to the LBMA, to buy it in, uh, here in the West and then deliver it at a premium um, in Shanghai where it will never come back. Currently, silver is basically 28 bucks an ounce in China right now, almost $3 an ounce higher than it is here in the West. So here again, they are incentivizing the Western traders to um, buy it uh, on COMEX of the LBMA and deliver it in um in in shanghai and it's it's even deeper than that i mean you know we're looking at a period of time right now where you know the lbma in terms of silver has reached all-time lows in silver holdings at 814 million ounces but 70 percent of that or so belongs to the bank of england and to the etfs like gl uh, slv rather yep. um 95 tons um, have moved from, uh, this is in, in gold right now, 95 tons of gold have moved out of the um, registered category into probably what's called the others category. And the others are believed to be sovereign wealth funds and family offices, big sophisticated investors who are standing for delivery on gold off of COMEX, 95 tons. That's a, that's a lot, right? That's and a lot. When we talk about the big one, however, is silver. Uh, over 1,200 tons have stood for delivery this year in silver. Uh, India just uh, announced that they uh, imported 76 million ounces in February. They've bought over 400 million ounces in the last two years, which coincides with almost the exact same amount being bled off of COMEX in the last two years. So this metal is the, the pre and I'm, I'm going to get to a point what I'm really trying to get at is to show you what's really happening and that the big big money yeah, across the globe do. knows what's happening. So India imports 400 million ounces over the last two years. That's almost exactly what's left the COMEX, right? India yep. says they just bought 76 million ounces in February alone, right? Uh, awesome. The Shanghai Metals Exchange is pricing silver three bucks higher than the West. So this is all moving in that direction, but that leads me to something. And I want to explain something that I think people really, 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 really need to listen to. Um, because to me, it explains everything. Um, and it explains it in a way that will lead to an awakening in this country where the price goes parabolic and people say, what the hell just happened? Um, and so... I've been talking for a very long time, for four years, if you will, that there will be a common settlement currency pegged to commodities issued yep. by the BRICS. Now, you know, there was a lot of people who were bummed out that it didn't happen in August, um, that, that, you know, the, the finance, they, they said to the finance ministers, go back to the drawing board, come back to the October meeting in Russia and present your findings. Now, I think they did it the right way because they're waiting for mass adoption. Well, they just brought in another five countries, including Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, two biggies, of course. And there's almost 35 countries that have formally applied to BRICS for the next meeting, which will be in October. There are 200 meetings leading up to the October meeting, all of them in Russia, all of them BRICS related. But the big one in October is when they will go over their findings of, of the common settlement currency. They will... Uh, admit more countries. You know, you're talking as it is right now, the BRICS have a greater population, human pop, percentage of human population, a greater percentage of global GDP. The majority of all of the rare earths and oil and natural gas and all of the gold and silver, all of the commodities 
They're the ones that control as it is, at least the majority in terms of global supply. They have two of the three largest nuclear arsenals and they are growing. They're growing with legitimacy. They are, are growing um, with, in every way. And, and, and that's not stopping. So they will issue but that common settlement currency. But what they've done in the meantime is trade with one another in local currencies. They've been, you know, Brazil, the second largest exporter of corn in the world. And, and you just saw the Chinese cut canceled all sorts of corn and soybean contracts with the American farmers this year. They're buying it from Brazil. Brazil's paying in yuan uh, and, and, or in real, whatever they're doing, whatever currencies they're using. Uh, it's they're not dollar. using dollars. Yeah. And if they receive yuan, if China pays for that corn and yuan, they can take that yuan and immediately convert it into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And all of the central banks are buying gold at, at, at a record no one has ever seen. So this is all happening. It's all coming. So that brings me to what's going on. So there was an interview just the other day in TASS, T-A-S-S. It's a Russian news agency. It's, it's a very yeah. good one. Their stories usually come out uh, a few days before what you find on the Western stories, which they're the same. It's just they're they're publishing it sooner. Anyways, <clears throat> there's a man named Yuri Yushakov, and he announced what we've talked about for years, that the BRICS nations plan to develop a new payment system based on the blockchain. Well, we've known that. They're going to do that, right? And But he said that it will be, and of course, he said that it will it will be something to the, you know, they have something called SIPS, the cross interbank payment system, which already sidesteps the SWIFT system. But this will be different. This will be a digital platform. Um, the Chinese invented something which they've already traded on recently called Project M Bridge, as in money. Project M Bridge is a digital platform that allows the um, uh, the cross border payment system of digital currencies sidestepping SWIFT. And they have already used it. There have been a couple big trades raced recently on the Project Embridge. They developed it with the United Arab Emirates, China, and Singapore. And so now it gets me to the point. So what he said is, is that the idea of their new currency will be two baskets. And I want to read this to you kind of verbatim so that okay. it makes yeah, sense, good. right? So the first idea is a basket of national currencies of all the countries involved kind of like the special drawing rights of, of um, the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and the second basket will be commodities, right? So he's going to have a basket of commodities. And, and what is the only other tier one reserve asset in the world as, as appointed by the Bank of International Settlements in 2019? Oh, yeah, that's gold. They reclassified it as the world's only yep. other tier one reserve asset. Who's been buying all the gold? Oh, yeah, 16 straight months in a row for China. That's what they tell us. India buying all of this gold and silver. I mean, they're all gobbling it up, right? The only yep. other tier one reserve asset. So he's told us it will be a basket of commodities and local currencies. Well, we've known all of that. That's nothing new. How about what's new? This is another thing I've been saying. Here's the new part. I have been saying for a long time that the reason these countries are not bitching is because they are the ones accumulating it all. Right. So what are they doing in China? Slowly turn up the arbitrage heat so that silver is three bucks higher in China. Gold is 80 bucks higher. And the stupid brain dead traders, the, the commercial bank, sophisticated bullion bank traders who have access to all the platforms, they'll buy it off the LBMA. They'll buy it off the COMEX and they will deliver it at a premium. The arbitrage will never come back to China. So that's what they're doing. So they understand what's going on. They understand that we are suppressing the paper price in order to support an illusion of a bond market that is stable and strong and a government that is stable and strong. Yet we are insolvent and we are broke and we are 150 plus trillion in debt. And a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. People know not only that, we weaponize and even confiscate your assets if we don't align the right way. So you know, we're getting to that last moment. And so the countries are accelerating their their increase in consumption and, and, and accumulation of all these commodities. And just as a side note, before I dot the I's and cross the T's here, a couple of years ago, the Chinese bought the London Metals Exchange, the LME, which is primarily base metals, copper, zinc, steel, you name it. And now they're going to start warehousing those metals that are traded on the LME in China. Do you see a trend here? It's not just 
gold and silver. It's all the base metals, all the rare earth metals, and even all of the soft commodities like like uh, wheat and 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 uh, soybeans and corn. Oh, wait a minute! The BRICS grain exchange—they just developed the new BRICS grain exchange. And you know what they say? Global prices are primarily determined by the Chicago Commodity Exchange. Uh, the ministry. Uh, uh, insists that the BRICS countries are the largest grain producers and exporters, but have no leverage to influence the price of the agricultural commodities critical for food security. So what are they going to do? They're going to start pricing the grain exchange. I said they'll do the same thing with gold and silver. And what do you know? They're all talking about the Moscow exchange. They're all talking about the Shanghai exchange. They're talking about the Dubai exchange. Well, you know, United Arab Emirates did just join the BRICS. Those two countries are part of the BRICS. Here's what's going to happen. At some point, when no one is stupid enough to deliver these very, very strategic, not just industrial, but strategic and precious metals and commodities where the West sets the price, where you can drop oil to negative $40 a barrel, really? Uh, because, the, because the futures market is controlling the, the commodity market at some point, just like that, they're gonna say, we don't believe in the Western markets anymore. For everyone in the Southern Hemisphere, it's now the Moscow Exchange, it's now the Shanghai Exchange and the exchange in Dubai that is gonna set the price of all the world's commodities. So let me go back to what he was saying. He says, the second piece of the new uh, uh, currency uh, is as follows. He says, for the moment, price is determined by Western speculation. So they know what's going on. We produce these commodities, we consume them, but we do not have our own price mechanism, which will balance supply and demand. During the COVID panic, the price for oil fell to nearly zero. No, it fell to negative 40 a barrel. Yep. It's impossible to make any strategic planning for economic development if you do not control prices of basic commodities. Here's the kicker. Price formation with this new currency will get rid of the Western exchanges of commodities. So what they are doing, they are using the suppression of the Western make-believe leveraged uh, commodity exchanges to drain everything. Not only that, they bought the damn LME for all the the, the base metals and all of the the, the you know the industrial metals. The, they're building a grain exchange. The whole can't you see how everything everything you would need instead of opaque debt instruments, everything you would need to be a a, a superpower everything you would need to be an industrial superpower, oh, a, yes. a commercial superpower, they're buying and accumulating it all and the gold and silver. So it's coming. It is. That, yeah, that does not, that does not put the Western nations, the G7 in a good position whatsoever. Right. That's and we will wake up one morning and gold and silver will be shoo, through the, what the hell just happened? Well, it got priced more appropriately to its actual value and its actual global demand rather than allowing the West to control the price based upon uh, an, an agenda that the majority of the world's population don't agree with. Yeah, and I, th I think the other point you made too, Andy, that's important there as well is a lot of this is smoke and mirrors for us to, to make the government and our country look like we're still super strong and that we don't have any issues. Right. So, well, you know, that's just it. It's all illusionary. Illusion. Right? It's all it's illusionary. All. Yeah. It is. So, and it's always been that way. And that's, I believe, why, you know, the, if you go way back and look at how they, why they suppressed gold in the beginning, the commercial banks would would uh, lease gold from the central banks at, at, at half a penny, half a cent, you know, like tiny, tiny, half a percent rather, excuse me, really, really low lease rates. And then they, their obligation would be to sell that gold and silver into the market to drive down the price, take the proceeds of those trades and buy U.S. treasuries. And they get to keep the spread between the really paltry low lease rates and what they're making on the treasury market. By driving down the price at a period of time in the 90s when no one was buying it, you were guaranteed to suppress the canary in the mine shaft, to support the bond market, to support the illusion of dollar strength. And, and, and then support the bond market, driving rates lower by taking those proceeds and buying more treasuries. Well, gold was so low and no one was buying it, those trades were easily covered. The commercial banks made a fortune and they were being told to do this by the central banks. This all came out in, in the Blanchard lawsuit against um, um, uh, JP Morgan, 
uh, and American Barrick, where it was admitted that American Barrick said, yes, we're doing this at the behest of J.P. Morgan, who's doing it at the behest of the U.S. government. They have sovereign immunity. Therefore, by extension, we, we declare sovereign immunity. But they did admit to doing just that. This is a game that's been going on for a long time, but I will simply say this. The only way to manipulate a market over an extended period of time is to push it in the direction it's going. And the whole world is pushing back against this manipulation. But right now, they're using, like in jiu-jitsu, the leverage of their opponent against them. They're using that leverage to drain the coffers, to empty the shelves of all of the world's commodities, not just gold and silver, corn, wheat, soybeans, precious metals, base metals, rare earth metals, all of it, they are gobbling at subsidized prices. And, and look, when you talk about treasury debt as an asset, it has a very, very minute history in terms of it being an asset. Globally, gold and silver and commodities are assets. Uh, a debt of an insolvent country who is running ever-increasing deficits, spending a, going into a trillion dollars deeper into debt every 100 days, you know, that's not an asset that you really want to hold. So I think all of these countries understand that. And, and so they're selling their treasuries. And instead of rolling them over like they always did, because remember, the petrodollar deal was we value oil in dollars and then that the excess you put into treasuries. Well, instead of doing that, instead of putting the excess into treasuries or even rolling over their existing treasuries, they're selling them and buying gold which if you go back for the last 25 years to 2000, gold has appreciated on average almost 8% per year, 7.8%. It's outpaced the S&P 500 at 7% per year. It's obliterated the bond market performance with all of the low rates of the last 15 years. And there is no default risk. There is no confiscation or sanction risk. There is no, you know, you don't have this, this risk inherent right now with the U.S. government and the U.S. equity market, or excuse me, bond market, so these countries are saying, look, it's outperformed it. It has a longer history. There is no counterparty risk. There is no sanction risk where if we end up on the wrong side of the U.S. agenda, they're going to confiscate it, not just sanction it. Now they want to confiscate the Russian Forex reserves. And they're stupid enough to say that in Brazil, who is a member of BRICS. The whole thing is beyond, uh, it's just beyond imagination. It's it's almost too stupid to be stupid. It almost just seems like this is exactly the road that we are trying to incentivize the world to dump dollars and reset the system. But I would simply say this, that gold and silver right now represent an opportunity of a generation. When you look at the amount of sophisticated money across the globe using the suppression of the Western market to stockpile it, if you have vision and can see where this ultimately goes, yeah, it may not be tomorrow, may not be next year, at some point, Gold and silver will outpace everyone's expectations. Look at it one more way. The Congressional Budget Office, which is one of the last nonpartisan uh, groups in, in Washington, came out and said that by 2031, in less than seven years, 100% of, uh, of, of tax receipts will go to pay just the interest on the debt and mandatory entitlement spending, like Social Security, which is 70 plus trillion in the whole. How long ago was a trillion seconds? 31,688 years ago. And we're almost 77 trillion underfunded IOUs in Social Security. So they say, and, and by the way, their estimates don't even take into account the 12 million people that have entered this country illegally and who's going to pay for their housing, their schooling, their medical, all of that. Put that on the side burner for a moment. They say in less than seven years, 100% of tax revenues goes to pay just the interest on the debt and mandatory entitlement spendings. So what that really means is, is that 100% of discretionary spending, which would include military, has to be borrowed. So the rest of the world who we are putting under our thumb and coercing and, 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 and fighting with, they're going to lend us money to build our military? I wonder if that really is the case. We are a paper tiger. We are a country that is, 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 is broke, insolvent, and has lost its mind both in the way we deal with the world and what we are allowing to happen in the cities, the lawlessness, the election yep. issues, the judicial issues, everything. People look at this country in a very different way that they used to saying, what the hell's happened to the country where liberty and justice and freedom were the keystone of ideology that is now being whitewashed. Our, our culture is being whitewashed. And I think that is not lost on the rest of the world. Look, man, 
you don't buy gold and silver to get wealthy. You buy it because it is wealth. And the biggest money in the world is front running something. And they're using the suppression and the narrative that the West continues to, to roll out, which is very illusionary, as their cover for, I think, repositioning, de-dollarizing, pick whatever word you want to use, whatever phrase, whatever adjective. I think we will wake up one day uh, to wish that we would have would have minimized our exposure to the Western system, to the dollar, and sat on the sidelines in, in wealth that has been considered that for over 5,000 years. And I, and I do mean that. Honest to God, I do. I, I agree, too. So, Andy, looking at that, um, do you have any recommendations for people that may be hearing this for the first time? Uh, maybe they have a little bit of gold and silver. Maybe they don't. Maybe they've been considering this. So we've kind of talked about, you know, people may have a bunch of money in the in equities, right? Um, they can move that out, take the profits that they've made. Um, you gave them the option of looking at bonds. So that could outpace the CPI, but it's still going to be below the real interest rates that we're seeing. Sorry, the real inflation rate that we're seeing. Um, you've also got the option of just leaving cash in the bank, which I wouldn't recommend. It's it's not super safe there. Plus, you're not earning as much of a yield if you're going that direction. Um, I always recommend people have some closer to their to their home or to the to themselves in a safe in a place, and don't tell anybody that you have that um, just for rainy days. But if you have a large amount of money, I'm thinking even if you don't have a large amount of money, I'm thinking gold and silver is a good place for people to be. It's where I've been putting some of my family's wealth. Um, and so do you have any, you know, rules of thumb on percentages of like investable income or, um, you know, how does someone get started with this? And then what about the people that may already have, um, gold and silver? Is it time to maybe increase your portfolio? Um, you know, what are the suggestions that you guys look at with, for Miles Franklin, for example? Well, there's a very interesting phrase <clears throat> it's called asymmetrical risk reward. And it says, what is... What is what can you own that has the lowest downside and the highest upside? I would say that there are very few things I've ever seen in my life that rival silver. Uh, okay. It's disappearing in nature. It's coming out of the ground right now at seven to one when it's been 16 to one geologically for 5,000 years. And that's because like your skin is epidermis. Uh, silver is found in nature in a form called epithermal, very near the surface. And the big deposits were found decades ago. So much so that only roughly 30% of all the silver mined last year, about a billion ounces came to market. 300 million came from companies that mine silver. The rest came from byproduct mining, companies that are mining something completely and totally different and just stumble across it or through recycling. And so we have had two, three years of structural deficits of over 200 million ounces. Okay. Um, it's decreasing in nature. And it's increasing in demand in green and in digital and military applications, not to mention uh, it, its monetary renaissance that we've seen. And I think there are very few things that you can own on this planet that have such low downside and such remarkable upside. When you look at the distortion right now of almost 90 to 1 price ratio, yet it's coming out of the ground at 7 to 1, uh, this is as good of an opportunity as I've seen in my career in any asset low downside, high upside, diminished um, supply. It's, it's disappearing in nature, increase in demand. There's 500 ounces in the tip of every Tomahawk cruise missile. Think that's of all the missiles, and that's just one form of missile. Think of all of the missiles and high-tech aerospace and all the stuff that needs copious amounts of silver. And there are a lot of people who will tell you it's the military industrial complex that is holding down the price of silver for this reason. In mm -hmm. fact, they used to talk about it all the time in supply demand fundamentals. And many years ago, they stripped it out. Well, you know, I was giving a speech in Vancouver and was approached by, by a consultant for the DOD who said, you know, this is not classified, but you're right. There's between 13 and 15 uh, kilograms of silver in the tip of every tomahawk. Well, he said, that was the missile that I developed. In fact, he sent me this just the other day. This he's, He works for the DOD. And anyways, bottom line is, is that, he told me this, came right up to me, said, I heard you say that last year. I went back to the drawing board, did some digging, and he just told me this a few months ago. Well, how much silver is being blown up in all of these high-tech missiles all around the world in the Ukraine and in, oh, in, yeah, in wow. Israel wow. and Gaza, yeah. in, all everywhere? I mean, it's everywhere, and it's horrible. And so when you talk about a decreasing supply of silver, an increasing demand, not only industrially, so much so that you got, a, I don't know, a couple dozen companies in, in Canada that have approached the, the, the Canadian government and said, we need to reclassify silver, not as uh, an industrial metal, but as a strategic one. 
And so you're looking at an asset that is decreasing in nature, decreasing in supply, increasing in demand, and from a historical perspective, is trading roughly 11 times higher than its than its current um, supplied or, or, or uh, geologic footprint. And right now trading about four times higher than the 5,000 year old um, geologic footprint. It's way out of whack. And I would say silver to me is one of the most undervalued, underappreciated metals on the planet. And from an investment standpoint, I don't see anything better. As far as gold is concerned, look, um, it's at all time highs, but it should be a whole hell of a lot higher. And when you realize there is no resistance above it, we've already blown through that, sky's the limit. It should be a whole hell of a lot higher, way higher. And I think when you realize that the biggest money in the world is accumulating it, the, the, the most sophisticated bank in the world said it's the only other tier one asset, the Western price setting mechanism will, will go by the way of the dodo bird at some point. So I think that, you know, the one reason that I lean towards gold, if I had only one choice, is that it's the only other tier one asset in the world. Yep. But the idea is you buy silver at a ratio right now of roughly 90 to 1, mindful coming out of the ground at 7 to 1, knowing that the price ratio, forget about the, the geologic ratio, the price ratio since the Industrial Revolution has averaged about 42 to 1, largely because of logistics and gold's role in a monetary world versus silver in an industrial world. But that 42 to 1 uh, is a small sliver of historical precedence, which was always sure. 16 to 1 for 5,000 years. Yep. But at 42 to 1, which is the average price ratio of the last 100 plus years, you're double, you're double what it's averaged for the past almost 200 years. And if all we were to do is to reach its average of the last 150, 200 years, the money that you would put into silver right now, you could trade into gold and it would be like buying twice as much gold today as you would then. And, and you know, this happened in 2010. It was the first time that I did a YouTube podcast with Bix Weir. And, and I called him, I said, Bix, it's at 85 to one, the silver gold ratio. I said, I just did some digging. That's the second time in human history it's ever been that high. And let's tell everyone to trade their gold into silver, which I did. And within seven months, uh, you had um, $50 silver and $1,915 gold, that's 37 to one, just below its 200 year average. That means anyone who would have traded 85 ounces of silver, one ounce gold into 85 ounces of silver, seven months earlier, would have only needed 37 ounces to go back into gold, making almost two and a half times what you started with. To me, you go heavily into silver with the intention of trading some of it into gold when the ratio corrects, that would be the playbook. But yeah, I do think it's time. I think it is definitely time, just based upon everything coming together at the same time and the massive accumulation of both metals using the suppression of the Western market by the most sophisticated and well-informed traders on the globe. I think that's great. So um, w one last part of that, if people have gold and they don't have a lot of silver, would you, rec I, you can't, I, maybe you can't rec recommend anything directly on YouTube, but is it a consideration to think of selling some of that gold and going into silver? Sure it is. I mean, that's that's the swap. That's the exact same thing that we did in, the in 2010. So you take an ounce of gold and you trade it for, you know, between 85 and 90 ounces of silver, realizing it's coming out of the ground at 7 to 1 and it's averaged 40 to 1 for almost 200 years. So if all you do is reach its 100-year average, let alone it, forget about the 5,000-year footprint, Sure. But just reaching its 150 year average of 42 to one, it's a double. You trade back into gold, you double plus what you started with. <clears throat> and that's the idea. Um, it, it's a calculated speculation, one of the best I've ever seen in my life. Um, okay. Is that a guarantee? No, nothing is a guarantee in this crazy world we live in. But yes, from a standpoint of drawing up a play, I don't see a better one. And I think it, it again, asymmetrical risk reward holding silver at these levels is about as riskless as it gets with much, much higher upside potential than downside, in my opinion. I agree. And I mean, one of the reasons my my channel's name is Stacking Surfer is not be, just because I like the surf, but it's also because I want to help people surf what I see as one of the greatest waves coming of gold and silver price discovery. Um, you talk about log, logarithmic decay little by little by little by little, and then all of a sudden it happening. We've just talked about that today in, in reality of what could happen. 
And I'm starting to see that happen. So yeah, and, and, and it is, and you can see the way, much like the way that the bricks have been methodical, little by little by yep. little, growing in every single way, growing in 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 uh, strategic trade routes. They control basically the Red Sea and the Straits of Hormuz right now, growing in size. They they now you know w they're growing exponentially. It was five, now it's ten, and now there's another thirty five that have formally applied, and over twenty that have expressed interest, including Mexico. So we're growing, they're growing in size, and, and they're doing things in a very strategic way. There is, there is a serious consideration, and I believe this will happen, I've said it for three years, that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union will be melded into the BRICS. The SCO is the largest regional financial and military organization on the planet. And over the last two years, you've had, you've had Iran join both the BRICS and the SCO. You've had uh, Saudi Arabia join the BRICS and apply to the SCO. So the Eurasian Economic Union are all of the countries that, that end and stand, basically, that already have trading agreements with Russia. And you put all of these groups together along with the Belt Road Initiative, which is the largest infrastructure in human history, um, that fits like a hand in glove with all of the BRICS routes, um, you know, that's Asia's effort to to connect um, or China's effort to connect Asia, uh, South Africa, or Africa, not South Africa, all of Africa, um, parts of, of South America and Europe. And it's the largest infrastructure project ever or ever attempted. You're talking 85 to 90 percent of human population right there, let alone all of the, the commodities that that control the world that make the world go round. Um, not to mention a much larger military presence. And, and what you have is little bits of the G7 that become isolated and from the rest of the world. So little by little by little by little then all at once. And you have the dollar bulls and the, and the people who are um, recency biased and normalcy biased that will wake up one day to a religious experience. I really do believe that. But when is that one day? Don't know. They ha this has been going on for 17 years with the BRICS. But it has been as of recently that the acceleration of their uh, of their their growth, uh, of their um, sophistication, of their alliance. I mean, it's all really accelerated as of late. And uh, I think when you realize that you have between now and October, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 meetings, all BRICS related in Russia, the big one in October and then the election in November I don't know. The Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times, comes to mind. I don't think we've seen anything yet. Honest to God, I truly do not believe we have seen anything yet. No, that's what that's what I'm getting ready for. So, so Andy, I want to thank you for coming on the show today and uh, making this video with me. And um, I'm looking forward to doing a live stream with you soon. We talked about that before the, the show Love started. Love that. Yeah, let's so, do it. Um, we're going to find a date for you guys to do a live stream. So I'll give you enough time. We'll probably plan it two or three weeks in advance. So you guys have enough time to um, get your questions together. Um, and then we'll make sure that everybody knows that it's coming up. Um, in the meantime, if people are wanting to get more involved in purchasing precious metals, there's a lot of places that they have options to go to. Um, but I know that one that you're involved with that you that you are a part of and, and run is Miles Franklin. Um, I've got a good close friend that's been buying from you for a long time. He highly recommends you. He's he's recently purchased quite a bit of um, constitutional silver from you. And then he's also bought a, a handful of monster boxes. And he he's raving about everything that you guys do. And I know in addition to getting medals, you also have the ability to do IRAs, um, gold and silver IRAs, as well as vaulting for people that don't want to take um, the possession of it today, but want to keep it safe. Um, how is the best oh, way for them to reach out to you and, and learn a little bit more about what Miles Franklin can do? So we we have a new website that is going to come out replacing this one that's relatively yep. new that's coming out in June or July. The prices that we put on the website are um, much higher than the prices that we will offer people if they send us an email and, and say the Stacking Surfer recommended me in the subject line info at milesfranklin.com or just request the price list or questions of it, about anything you've heard on this show or uh, as you mentioned questions on precious metals iras or storage with our brinks program throughout north america we i believe are the envy of the storage industry so any yep. questions you have or just simply want to see a more competitive updated price list send an email stacking surfer sent me to info 
at milesfranklin.com and we will do that and we would love to work with you. Um, all of our brokers have tremendous experience and sophistication in everything that we've just talked about, politics, geopolitics, economics. Many of them were on Wall Street. Some of them went to school at Wharton. I mean, we've got a very distinguished career uh, uh, or um, group rather uh, of um, brokers who will not only walk you through everything, uh, but also be able to answer any questions you have, which, which is important in my mind. So send us a message and we'll get back to you. And it's, it's a great way to support the channel, guys. It's a great way to support what Andy's doing and the message he's getting out there. And, um, you know, everything Andy said is what I'm seeing in the market. Um, I've started picking up more silver than I have in the past. I still have gold because I see that as wealth insurance. So I may need to draw on it. I um, mean, gold is also has a, a lower premium, so it's a little easier to move in and out of if you need to. So for me, I'm upping my silver game. I am moving some of my gold to do that because um, I'm seeing the writing on the wall. I'm seeing that we're getting close to the end of this thing. And um, when it does happen, I like Andy said, I think it's going to be you wake up. It's just happened. And next thing you know, it's it's a little too late. So, Andy, thank you very much for coming on. And we'll let everybody know when we get that date for the live stream. And until next time, everybody, peace out. See you guys.